Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Streamlining the Drug Development Process with XB Cho Transient Expression System. I am Brenda Kelly Kim of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar sponsored by Gibco, part of Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information, please visit www.thermofisher.com slash protein expression. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we hope you ask questions during our event. You can submit your questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many of your questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems hearing or viewing this presentation properly, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jonathan Zamuda. Jonathan Zamuda is director of the cell biology in the Life Sciences Solution Group at Thermo Fisher Scientific in Frederick, Maryland. John leads a team of scientists dedicated to discovering and developing new technologies and products useful for cell biology applications, including transient protein expression, advanced cell culture, and rare cell analysis. Dr. Zamuda received his PhD in cell biology from the University of Maryland, College Park, and his undergraduate degree from Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. I will now turn it over to Dr. Zamuda for his presentation. Great, thank you very much, Brenda, for the kind introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody online joining us today. As Brenda mentioned, my name is Jonathan Zamuda. I'm a director of cell biology at our Frederick, Maryland site, just about 40 miles due north of Washington, D.C. on the east coast of the United States. So I'd first like to thank you all for joining us for this first ever GIPCO Expression World event, where we bring together the best and brightest minds in the protein expression world. We hope that this will be the first of many such events to come where researchers from around the world can come together to discuss hot topics in the protein expression world and share their experiences. So without further ado, today I will jump right into my presentation on our recently launched XBCHO transient expression system, where I will provide a generic overview of the system, as well as sharing the latest data that we have and tips for optimizing use of the system. So while I don't need to really dig into why CHO is important for transient protein expression, I think all of you online probably already know this, but at least 70% of all biologics are manufactured in CHO cells. And in fact, in 2014, 11 of the biologics approved by CEDAR, eight of them were made in CHO, one was made in NS0 cells, and two in bacteria. So CHO certainly seems to be an expression system that will be with us for the foreseeable future. And for CHO cells, really one of the keys for their utility is that we need to have accurate post-translational modifications. And these make CHO-derived proteins more relevant for critical studies, including biological activity, PKPD studies, animal models, and toxicology studies. And secondly, some proteins simply don't express well in 293 cells. So having a secondary high-expressing mammalian transient expression system is quite beneficial in those instances. But our end goal in developing the XBCHO system was truly around enabling a seamless transition for researchers to go from discovery to clinic to commercial manufacturing, allowing all of their work to begin in CHO and stay in CHO, all the way from discovery through final clinical manufacturing. And if we take just a quick look at the list of blockbuster drugs that have been made and currently are made in CHO cells, we can see that in the year 2013, just the top 11 constituted $57 billion in, in revenue for drug companies. All of these, once again, made in CHO cells. So clearly, again, showing how important the CHO cell is to the bioproduction and the biopharma industry. 
But we all know that there is challenges with transient CHO that have been relatively lesser with HEC-293 cells. So when we compare the existing transient CHO systems a couple years back to the 293-based systems, transient CHO systems traditionally had much lower expression levels versus 293 cells. This led to a high cost in terms of both time and dollars per mega of protein made in CHO cells. And the alternatives at the time, for example, making stable CHO cell lines, significantly lengthened timelines for projects. And so when we look back to the Freestyle Max CHO system that preceded XBCHO, we could see that for a given human IgG tested in this slide, a typical titer would range between about 10 to 20 mg per liter, whereas that same antibody expressed in the XB293 system could attain 1 to 1.2 grams per liter. So this really was the problem that we had, was how to enable a transient CHO system to reach or exceed levels of protein expression that the best XB293 type systems were able to attain. And so very similar to our strategy with XB293, when we asked ourselves how we can improve transient CHO titers, we understood that optimization of the individual components of the system gave only modest gains at best. So it really wasn't until these systems-based approaches were implemented that we could see synergistic and multifold improvements in protein expression compared to the prior systems. And in the case of XBCHO, this really meant going back to the drawing board for all of the componentry in the system. And all of the components, beginning with the high-expressing XBCHO S cell line, that's matched to the XBCHO media and the feed to allow for long-term high-density expression runs as well as a high efficiency transfection reagent that allows for high density transfection of CHO cells. Our expression enhancers that allow for significant improvements in protein expression, as well as tying all this into a seamless workflow that's very familiar to those of you who have used the XB293 system. And it really is not until all of these are brought together into an optimized transient expression system that we can see these synergistic effects and these big improvements in titers from the transient CHO. So today what I'd like to do is go through some of the uh, XB CHO system components, as well as sharing new data along the way for all of the different components of the system that will provide some tips for optimizing the performance, as well as troubleshooting the XB CHO system. So any transient expression system begins with the cell line itself, and in looking back at how the XBCHOS cells were, uh, were discovered, we went back and we decided we had a, a decision point on whether we would genetically engineer cells to try to boost protein expression or look for natural derived clones that would allow for a more simplified workflow. And the XBCHOS cells, it turns out, is in fact a natural subclone derived from our GMP CHOS cell banks. So there's no genetic engineering of these cells. It is a natural, high-expressing, uh, high-density uh, CHO-S variant. And these cells have been adapted for high-density culture, which I'll show on the next slide, but routinely able to generate densities of 20 million cells per mil or greater in shake flask cultures. The cells have a very short doubling time as well of about 17 to 18 hours, which allows the cells to reach the densities required for trans transient expression runs uh, when you are ready to perform those runs. The cells typically in culture have a diameter of about 14 microns, and then as the cells are transfected and start to express high levels of protein, uh, you can see that diameter of those cells increase over the time of the expression run up to 19 to 20 microns, at which time when the cell uh, expression starts to fall off, you will then see the cells start shrinking again, and that's one of the telltale signs that your expression run is coming to an end. So these cells can be very efficiently transfected at high densities, and they have quite high specific productivity. So we estimate around the 27 to 30 of PCD range. And the growth and expression profiles are relatively consistent for these cells, as shown on the bottom right here, uh, over the course of 18 passages in this case, uh, tighter remaining consistent and as well as the growth uh, characteristics of the cells. Also, very importantly, when we look to develop these cells, we had to ensure that we had CHO-like glycosylation profiles, as well as that we were generating high-quality, biologically active protein. 
So upon identifying the XBHOS cell clones for testing, we went about developing here in Frederick the XBCHO expression media to specifically be matched to these XBCHO clones. And as we all know, most or all transient CHO expression media were originally developed for stable CHO cell culture. And in fact, the bioproduction media attributes do not necessarily translate into those requirements that make for the best transient expression media. So when we set about to identify and develop the XBCHO expression media, we had a couple of attributes as well that we wanted to make sure that we were able to attain. One being that there was no supplementation of the media required, that once you open the bottle, the media was, was ready to go. That we had one media for both growth and transfection of the cells. That it was serum free, animal origin free, chemically defined and protein free. Manufactured under CGMP, that it supports the high density cell growth that would allow us to transfect the XBCHO cells at a high density and take advantage of that additional biomass in terms of protein expression. And that the media would be specifically matched to an XBCHO feed that would allow for, again, these elongated high density transfection runs. Lastly, we made sure that any of the regulatory import export limitations related to specific componentry of the XBCHO media uh, were eliminated so that we had no issues in uh, shipping this media anywhere in the world. And as I mentioned in the last slide, in the right hand side of this slide, you can see growth profiles for XBCHO cells at both passage 10 and 24. And once again, you see that those cells in shake flask cultures are able to attain about 20 million cells per mil. And these profiles are very important because they go into the routine subculturing of these cells. As you can see, the XBCHO cells, because they're such a high density line, really don't hit their mid log phase or start their log phase growth until about 4 million cells per mil. And so we always recommend that XBCHO cells are allowed to grow to at least 4 million cells per mil at the time of subculturing to ensure that they have at least initiated their log phase growth. And you can see that quite extended log phase growth of the cells up to about 20 million cells per mil, which once again allows us to take advantage of high density transfection of these cells. So now I'll move on into the XBCHO feed, which is a novel formulation that allows for these high density transfection runs and these long term expression runs where we can really get the most out of the expression capabilities and profiles of the CHO cells. So this novel feed formulation was specifically matched to the expression media. And when we look at the XBCHO protocol, there are three different protocols that the end user can run. Um, two of them require single feeds and one of them, our max titer protocol, requires two feeds uh, for attaining maximum titers within the system. But as you see on the bottom left, the XBCHO system is, is quite robust and the timing of that second feed is flexible across many days. So while we recommend adding that second feed on day five, if it were to be added on day four or six, or even as far as day seven, very minimal performance uh, impacts uh, are shown to the system. Again, being a characteristic of this feed and its ability to have high density nutrients uh, packed into, into the solution. And just from a standpoint of convenience of use, the XBCHO feed does not need to be warmed prior to addition. And on the bottom right hand side, what we actually show here is uh, different feed additions, different percentages of XBCHO feed in the standard titer protocol, which utilizes a 37C incubation uh, for the entire expression run. And we can see here that in the range of 20 to 24 percent feed is optimal for the standard titer protocol. In the original XBCHO protocol, we had suggested adding 30 percent feed, but we now find that to be uh, excessive for the needs of the standard titer protocol out to eight to 10 days. And we will soon be releasing a minor revision uh, indicating the use of 24 percent feed which keeps the percentage feed in the standard and high titer protocols, both of the one feed protocols, identical to one another. And next I'd like to take a few moments to talk about the Xbifectamine Cho Enhancer. So this enhancer solution was determined through a rigorous DOE approach in which we looked at uh, combinations of various components that allowed for high boosts in expression of recombinant proteins while also not impacting the viability of the cultures, which is very important, as many uh, typical uh, enhancer reagents at higher concentrations can have very detrimental effects on cell density throughout the expression run. 
So what we show on the bottom left here is the XB-CHO system. In the absence of either the expophectomy CHO enhancer or the XB-CHO feed, and those titers are quite low. And what happens in this instance, is the XB-CHO S cells are, are transfected, uh, but they're so healthy, happy, and robustly growing that they, they focus most of their energy on dividing instead of producing protein. And so the titers are actually quite low in this instance, so a couple hundred milligrams per liter. Now in the middle blue bar, what you see is that if we add the feed to give the cells a little bit more boost, but we have no enhancer, we can get reasonable titers, in this case about one gram per liter. But it is not until we add the enhancer in conjunction with the feed that we really see these synergistic effects and this impact on titers, where in the case of this human IgG that we use for many of our studies, we can attain titers of greater than three grams per liter. And importantly, again, as with the feed, the expophectomy show enhancer does not need to be worn prior to addition. And from a convenience standpoint, on the bottom right, we show that the XP Cho feed and enhancer may be added together prior to addition, which reduces the number of additions per flask from two to one. And what we show here in the bottom right is either the, the tighter profiles for enhancer and feed added fresh in the red line, which is largely superimposed upon enhancer and feed that were mixed and held for one day at 4C or even up to two weeks at 4C. So this is especially beneficial when working at small scales, for example, 96 and 24 well protocols that I will share later in the presentation, where it's quite difficult to be adding uh, very small volumes of multiple reagents to those wells. And so again, in, in most, if not all instances, um, it is perfectly fine to add these together ahead of time and save yourself a step in the protocol. Now importantly, I'll focus the next few slides on the expophectamine Cho transfection reagent. As this is a novel transfection reagent with some different characteristics versus many of the traditional transfection reagents that have been used for protein expression. So here on the bottom left, we show the transfection efficiencies of the XB293 cells on the far left of the x-axis. And the blue bars indicate uh, the GFP expression at 24 hours and the red bars at 48 hours. So as expected, the XB293 cells are, are very highly uh, transfected uh, within 24 to 48 hours, reaching about 90% transfection efficiency. And when we look back to our Freestyle Max CHO system, we could see at best about 40% transfection efficiency of CHO cells, which is in, very much in line with what we had uh, heard from, from many collaborators in the industry. When we looked at XB CHO with the expophectomy CHO reagent, we could see for either of the protocols, the standard high titer or max titer, that we can get upwards of 80% and at times even higher than that transfection efficiency of the CHO cells. So we are now approaching the transfection efficiency seen with 293 cells, which are widely known to be relatively easy to transfect, and getting very similar transfection efficiencies, even though in XBCHO we're transfecting cells at 6 million cells per mil, which is significantly higher even than XB293, which utilizes 3 million cells per mil, and six times higher than the industry normal of 1 million cells per mil, which again really allows us to take advantage of this additional biomass for generating higher titers of protein. So on the right is some important information that we discuss about uh, the proper mixing of the expophectamine CHO reagent. And what we call out in the protocol is just very gentle mixing. So when your diluted expophectamine CHO is added to your diluted plasma DNA, we recommend just gentle inversion or one or two pipettings to mix them. The complexation happens almost instantaneously with expophectamine CHO. So in the blue line, you see a, a loss in titer if the uh, reagents are mixed together with what we term here rough mixing, which in this case was taking a pipette and uh, vigorously pipetting up and down 10 times, or vortexing in green, which is not uncommon to many transfection reagents, uh, we see a further loss in titer. So what we recommend, again, is just a very general mixing of the, of the complexation reaction for best results. And very importantly, this, these are some new data that we've uh, recently generated in terms of the importance of both the whole time of the diluted expophectamine CHO reagent in OptiCHO, as well as the complexation time. So in, in prior presentations, many of you have probably seen the data on the right where we have shown that 
really between less than one minute and five minutes is optimal for complexation of the expofectamine Cho reagent and the diluted plasma DNA. And up to 10 minutes, you, you see very little loss in performance. But for longer hold times, 20 and 30 minutes on the far right, you can see that there was a significant loss in titer as the complexation reaction uh, went on for, for too long. So on the left, we looked into this a bit further. And we looked at just the hold time of the diluted expofectamine Cho reagent in OptiPro. And we realized that the change in titers or the reduction in titers that we were seeing during the, during the complexation reaction was also partly responsible for uh, or, or caused by the hold time of the diluted expofectamine Cho reagent. So what we show in blue is the time elapsed between diluting the expofectamine Cho reagent in cold OptiPro prior to adding it to the plasma DNA and then incubating for five minutes. And so what we suggest as a best practice is to dilute the expofectamine Cho reagent and then immediately, uh, immediately upon dilution, uh, be ready to add it to the plasmid DNA. So in the blue, you see that holding diluted expofectamine Cho reagent up to five minutes has no impact on the titers. Uh, but longer hold times, you see that characteristic drop, as you see also in the red bars, at 20 to 30 minutes. So our recommendation, again, will be to dilute uh, at the time of use um, and uh, add directly to your plasma DNA right at the time of complexation. And I will get into some other data about if that's not feasible. Um, we have, uh, in our scale down protocols, we simply dilute the plasma DNA in the total volume of OptiPro that would normally be used to dilute both transfection reagent and DNA. And then we add the expofectamine Cho reagent neat to the diluted plasma DNA. So in instances where you would want to have a hold time for the diluted expofectamine Cho reagent, uh, we can suggest simply adding undiluted expofectamine Cho to twice diluted plasma DNA, which will allow for that uh, necessary hold time. And then one other important aspect of the expofectamine Cho transfection reagent is the optimal DNA concentration to be used. And even though we're using very high cell densities at the time of transfection, low amounts of plasma DNA are required for most proteins. And in many instances, what we can see is that with higher concentrations of plasma DNA, we can see slight dips in cell viability across the expression run because the transfection of the DNA into the cells is imparting some stress on the cells. And as we show here in the data, Typically, 0.6 to 0.8 micrograms per mil of transfection volume is optimal for most proteins in the XBCHO system. Uh, as little as 0.5 uh, may be fine for most proteins as well. So when using one microgram or even higher, uh, take into consideration the fact that this may have negative impacts on cell vi viability due to the additional stress being imparted on the cells by the uh, high efficiency transfection of the high, high, uh, high concentration DNA. So to those of you that are unfamiliar with the workflow for XBCHO, I'll just walk through that quickly and then we'll start to move into some performance data. Very similar to the XB293 transfection system, the first step of XBCHO takes place one day prior to uh, transfection, where the cells are seeded at about three to three and a half million cells per mil, placed back at 37C with shaking overnight at which time, 24 hours later, the cells will attain somewhere in the 8 to 10 million cells per mil range. The cells are then diluted in step two to 6 million cells per mil with fresh XBCHO media, at which time the complexation reaction, uh, the dilution of the plasma DNA in cold OptiPro and the dilution of the expofectamine Cho in cold OptiPro take place. And then in step five, the complexation reaction takes place for zero to five minutes. So the complexes are essentially formed instantaneously. So the moment that they are added together and mixed, they are ready to be added to the flasks. Step six shows the addition of the complexation reaction to the uh, expression flasks. And typically this is done in a general dropwise manner with swirling of the flask. And then step seven is where we have the inflection point between the three XBCHO protocols between the, the standard protocol that runs at 37C throughout the protocol versus the high titer and max titer protocols that have the temperature shifted about 22 uh, to 24 hours after transfection. 
So in step seven, we see the addition uh, for all protocols of the expofectamine show enhancer and feed. And again, these may be added cold and they may be mixed together prior to addition to the flask. And then uh, either the flasks are put back at 37C for the standard protocol or shifted to 32C for the high titer and max titer protocols. And then finally in step eight, we see the addition of the second feed for the XPCHO max titer protocol, again running at 32C uh, across the entire expression run. So these slides are downloadable to all of you and I, I won't take too much time to go through. These are um, some external data uh, that many labs have provided us with um, some of the results of the XPCHO system compared to their existing 293 or CHO based systems. And what I'd just like to call out here is, is some of these items in red where uh, we have seen, for example, in, in the middle column, um, two human antibodies that one being either undetectable in the current system or precipitated in, in the current system that were still able to attain uh, about half a gram per liter or a third of a gram per liter in the XPCHO system. And then on the far right, some data around bispecific proteins that could not be expressed in the uh, current expression systems of this particular lab, and that generated nearly three quarters of a gram per liter uh, purified protein from, from XPCHO, as well as um, some additional non-antibody proteins that could not be secreted uh, and that, secrete, uh, that were expressed well in the XPCHO system. And so what we have seen as a general takeaway is that it seems that the XPCHO system does a very um, good job at expressing a very broad range of proteins, uh, some of which do not express well as uh, in the XP293 system. And again, uh, part of the rationale for having this secondary um, high expressing mammalian system that would either be your or first line of expression or a backup to um, your existing systems for hard to express proteins. And then what we show in this slide is just a direct comparison of a panel of 20 monoclonal antibodies, rabbit monoclonal antibodies, that were tested in the XB293 system and the XBCHO system using the max titer protocol. And we see XBCHO in blue and XB293 in the red bars. And what we see is that we had uh, between a 1.4 and 3.9 fold improvement uh, for all proteins in XBCHO compared to XB293 with a mean of a 2.4 fold improvement. And if we look at uh, monoclonal antibody 19, that was one, in fact, that um, could not be expressed in XB293, yet we were still able to see about 200 mg per liter in XBCHO. However, uh, monoclonal antibody number 20 uh, was actually one that was not able to be expressed in, in either system. So there are still proteins that are problematic regardless of the switch between 293 and CHO systems. So what I'd like to do now is go through the, the protocol itself and, and again, some, some tips for troubleshooting the protocol. And this is a, a busy slide, but it shows the uh, in the large graph, the kinetics of antibody expression using the three different protocols of the XPCHO system. So in red, we see the max titer protocol that will go out all the way to 14 days, but we recommend that a typical harvest time is probably no more than 12 days as you hit a point of diminishing returns uh, as you go longer than, than 12 days. And you can see the kinetics of the antibody expression. And when you compare it to XB293 in the solid uh, dotted line, um, XB293 for this particular antibody will express at about one gram per liter at about six days post expression. And what we see that the max titer protocol is capable of attaining the same titers for this protein at the same time at about six days post transfection. But the, the real hall, hallmark of the CHO cells is this ability to have these very elongated expression runs and to continue to make significant amounts of protein all the way out to 12 or 14 days. So the expression profiles and kinetics are very different between 293 cells and CHO cells, whereas the 293 cells tend to make protein very quickly and then the cultures crash very rapidly. The CHO cells uh, make protein for a much more elongated period of time and then have a uh, more gentle um, uh, loss of cell viability toward the end of the expression runs. And in fact, when conditions are optimal, uh, these cells will stay viable for many days past day 14, uh, although they do not make uh, additional protein at that time. 
And then in blue, we see the results for the high titer protocol, which uses one feed and a temperature shift that is able to obtain about two thirds of the uh, titer of the max titer protocol. And then in green, we see the standard protocol, which requires no special equipment, 37C. It's essentially the exact same protocol as, as XP293. And there we can attain approximately the same uh, titers of uh, antibody as we see in XP293 in about the eight to nine day time frame. And then if we look at the, the upper left, uh, this is one of the, the viable cell density over time is one of the hallmarks of both the XB293 and XB Cho system in the manner in which we've been able to uh, control these very rapid and high density uh, cells uh, from proliferating during the course of the expression run. So on the Y axis, you see the uh, beginning transfection density of 6 million cells per mil for both the standard protocol in green and the max titer protocol in red. And what you see is uh, from the time of transfection until about 24 to 48 hours, you'll see an increase, uh, probably about a doubling of the cells um, until the time at which the enhancer and the feed are added, at, at which time the cells remain, the density remains fairly steady over the course of the run. So in red, you'll see a bit of a dilution effect when the enhancer and the, and the feed are added. In green, the cells, because they're not being controlled further by the 32C temp shift, grow to a slightly higher density and maintain that higher density and very high viability uh, throughout the expression run. So in green, we see about uh, somewhere in the range of typically here about 10 million, about nine to 10 million cells per mil um, across the entire expression run and slightly lower than that for the maximum titer protocol. But these, as I'll show you in the next slide, are the uh, hallmark for optimal performance of the, of the XPCHO system. And then what I showed just on, on the bottom of the graphs is a comparison to other existing transient CHO systems um, performed either with or without temperature shift. And you can see that once again, the synergistic uh, impact of developing all the system components specifically for the XP CHO system allows for 20 fold or, or higher improvements in titer um, compared to other transient CHO systems. So this is a very important slide, and um, we have worked with you know, many, many labs um, to help troubleshoot um, some instances uh, very similar to this. And so we've um, taken into account uh, those discussions and, and ensured that uh, we understand well how to help labs uh, troubleshoot when they're seeing um, some issues with cell viability. So if we look on the, on the left, the high viability of the cells at the time of harvest is truly the key indicator of system performance for, for XBCHO. If the viability is high at the time of harvest, the VCD will remain relatively consistent over the course of the run and the titers will be maximal. So in this case, we show in the three different lines the percent viability for the high, max, and standard titer protocols going all the way out to 14 days. And again, this is probably um, undesirable to take it out this far. Um, aside from the timing and the, the relative drop-off in titer, um, one must take into consideration uh, impacts on protein uh, and potentially post-translational modifications and, and quality of some proteins that are less stable um, during these elongated expression runs. For monoclonal antibodies, less important, very stable, and you can push them out you know, 12 or 14 days if, if desired. But usually 12 days is about as far as you need to go for max titer, 10 for high titer, and seven or eight for the standard protocol. But the key here being is that at the time of takedown, in this case on day 14, the viability is still very high, so hovering uh, almost at the 80% range. And this is really what you want to see. This is the number one troubleshooting tip to identify that you have optimal uh, culture and growth conditions and transfection conditions for the system. On the right, what we show is a relatively uh, uh, dramatized um, uh, view of what can happen when conditions are not optimal. So we show uh, in the thick red line a loss of cell viability on or about day seven in a compromised run. And in instances along these lines, assuming that this loss in viability is not due to the toxic nature of the protein being expressed, this type of a viability profile um, immediately lets us know that some additional optimizations um, can take place to the system. And that may be simply with regard to cell handling, um, maybe oftentimes with regard to um, volumes in culture flasks and, and shake speeds. 
Um, but this type of a profile, if you're um, seeing this in your cultures, is certainly something that, that typically can be uh, troubleshot relatively uh, easily. And um, just to ensure that when you have the system set up, you're keeping an eye on that. And in these types of instances, uh, the uh, performance of the system should be able to be improved so that the viability curves look more like those running across the top. So the XPCHO system, even if uh, not performing optimally uh, or not um, under optimized conditions, you see the asterisk on about, it, the cells will re retain their, maintain their viability for about seven to eight days in culture, at which time uh, the viability will start to drop. Now, when this viability starts to drop in the XPCHO system, the cells will uh, rapidly um, lose their ability to make additional protein. And um, at that point, it would be wise to um, harvest the supernatin that you have, uh, as the cells will not make significant protein at this time. And you will see, as I mentioned previously, the diameter start to uh, become smaller of the cells, the, the cell diameter becomes smaller. And that um, shrinking of the cells is the first indicator that your expression run is, is coming to an end. So in terms of scalable protein production, I'd like to you know, share some um, older data and then move into some, some new protocols that we uh, have just released online. And so XPCHO is directly scalable from the 125 milliliter flask to the two liter flask sizes, um, as shown in the uh, figure in the upper left. And what we show there is the flask size, firstly, uh, below the x-axis, followed by the, the recommended transfection volume or typical transfection volume, the final volume upon addition of all the feeds and enhancers, and the speed for uh, all of those different flask sizes, which in our case of the 19 millimeter orbital shakers that we use, uh, we tend to use 125 RPM across the 125 mil to two liter scale. Uh, that RPM for um, many users at, at the 25 millimeter uh, orbital diameter can range in the 115 to 120 range uh, optimally. And then the, on the far right of the uh, x-axis, we see the three liter flask, so the Fernback style uh, flasks in this case and um, showing a final culture volume of one liter. Uh, but because of the very different shape of these flasks, the RPMs for uh, the three liter flasks tend to be uh, much lower in the 70 to 80 RPM range. And you see that uh, on the lower right-hand side, a three liter flask at either 70 or 80 RPM or a 2.8 liter flask at 80 RPM, uh, all showing relatively uh, similar results but again, it's important that that speed um, is reduced significantly for the different shape flasks of the, of the three liter uh, Fernback style. So now we'll get into some of the later, latest data that we have around um, scaling the system down. So as we uh, move forward, um, our intentions are to provide uh, XPCHO protocols for scales ranging from, in this case, 96 well plates, all the way up to potentially 10 or 20 liter wave bags, as well as bioreactors, uh, guidance for, for performance there as well. And what we show here on the left is the use of 24 deep well plates, and some of the information is captured below for that protocol. Uh, this also exists as an application note on our XPCHO website, at the Thermo Fisher site. And what we show here uh, on the left-hand side of the x-axis is the standard protocol where we harvested at day eight. In red, either a control 125 ml flask, or in blue, a 24 deep well plate. So these deep well plates, in, in this case, uh, we have used the Axigen uh, pyramid bottom plates. Uh, the round bottom plates also work well. Uh, we've seen uh, slightly more robustness in terms of uh, toleration of uh, different shake speeds and volumes in the pyramid bottom plates. It seems they, they mix a little bit better. But in this case, we're simply adapting our standard uh, 19 millimeter shakers shown there um, and running them at 225 RPM with a two and a half mil transfection volume leading to about a final three and a half mil uh, volume of supernatant. And then going back up to the graph on top, we see the data also for the high titer protocol that again was harvested at, at day eight, uh, compared in red to the control flask and the 24 deep well in blue. Now in all of these instances, um, without specialized equipment, uh, one will see evaporation in these wells, so that must be taken into account. And so for that reason, we have decided in, in this slide to harvest on day eight, uh, and the data shown take into account the evaporation that we see uh, between the shake flasks and the 24 deep well plates. 
On the right, we see the protocol for 96 deep well plates. So again, listed are the oxygen round bottom plates. Uh, in this case, we use a three millimeter orbital shaker. And it's very important that this is a orbital shaker and not a linear shaker that might be utilized more for uh, ELISA work. Uh, the orbit is uh, necessary to keep the very high density cells um, suspended during the expression run. And in this case, we've seen that about 850 to 950 RPM uh, does a very nice job of keeping uh, excellent viability of the cells. And in this case, we have about an 800 microliter transfection volume with a one mil final volume once the enhancers and fees are added. So again, in the figure we, sh we show in both instances for the standard and uh, high titer protocols uh, in red, the 125 ml flask data and the corresponding titers in blue for the 96 well plates. So again, uh, very scalable uh, across the, the smaller um, size vessels. And then as part of the same application note, we provide guidance around the use of these mini bioreactors or the spin tubes. So uh, on the bottom right, you see the vented caps of these 50 ml tubes. Um, these are very useful to allow for uh, high volume, uh, or, or I'm sorry, um, high throughput runs of relatively high volumes of uh, culture media. So in this case, we, we've shown optimized conditions uh, for these uh, mini bioreactor tubes. Um, using either uh, 20 mLs or 25 mLs expression volumes. And again, on the left with the standard protocol with the day eight harvest, red shows the control flask and blue shows two different volumes in the 50 mL mini bioreactor tubes, showing once again, uh, excellent scalability. And on the right, we see the high titer protocol, in this case, harvested at day 10. Uh, we have less uh, evaporation issues with the mini bioreactor tubes. The control flask in red again and 20 to 25 ml expression volume shown in blue. So it's important to note here that we have um, also uh, performed these runs at even higher um, volumes and they simply require um, changing the shake speed a bit to keep that higher volume in suspension. And what we show on top that the conditions that we've optimized here are at about 240 RPMs. Uh, using a 19 millimeter shaker in our case, and then um, having these at a 45 degree angle. So the 45 degree angle is important uh, to keep the cells moving um, at much lower volume. So in the five to seven and a half mil transfection volume range, um, these can be placed vertically on the shakers uh, as they do not need that extra angle to keep all of the cells um, suspended during the runs. So next, I wanted to share some of the uh, exciting work that we have uh, ongoing for wave bags. Uh, we have completed the protocol for the uh, standard protocol right now. And in fact, today we are uh, finalizing the takedown for the uh, proof of uh, concept runs for both the high and maximum tighter protocols. And um, what we show here is a, is a workflow. There's a, a lot of uh, guidance in here um, uh, ahead of the application node that we, we hope to get out in the next month or so. But this is uh, using the standard wave system. Um, in the case of this protocol, we have um, worked up to a 10 liter volume in the, the wave system where um, on the, the second icon, you see that we um, culture cells, about two liters of cells in the, the five liter uh, Thompson flasks at 120 RPM. These cells are seeded at 0.15 uh, times 10 to the six cells per mil for four days, at which time we inoculate five liters of cells at one and a half million cells per mil into the wave bags. And you see the, uh, the characteristics of that initial um, rock angle and shake speed, a rock angle of, of nine degrees at 22 and a half RPMs, 36 and a half degrees C, with 8% CO2, 21% O2, and balanced, uh, balanced nitrogen. These cells will then go for 48 hours. So we wanna have a relatively short period of time that the cells grow up to the density that's uh, required for the transfection. And at that time, the cells are diluted to six million cells per mil. And in this case, it was through the addition of about two and a half liters of media, uh, giving a total volume now in the bag of about seven and a half liters. The cells are then transfected, and in this case, it's about 600 mils of the complexation mixture, at which time the rock angle and the RPMs are lowered a bit uh, post-transfection to account for that additional stress that is placed on the cells through the transfection of the cells. 
And then on the following day, the feed and the enhancer are added, and the rock angle is increased and the speed is increased uh, to, take account, to take into account the additional volume added to the wave bags. And so, uh, as I mentioned, we are in the process of uh, compiling data right now. Uh, we have seen that the wave system holds excellent viability of the cells across the expression runs. In fact, uh, even better under these conditions than we see in the shake flasks. And uh, we are uh, working through all of the tighter data right now, and again, hope to have this as an application note in the very near future. So what I'd like to move into now is a, a bit of the protein characterization work that has been done to date, and then talk a, a bit about uh, some of the additional work that we intend to do going forward. So what we show here is uh, the uh, non-reduced SDS page for a human IgG1 sample that has been expressed on the left in lanes 3, 4, and 6 in the XBCHO system using either the standard high titer or max titer protocols. And below that at the bottom of the gel, you see the titers at the time of harvest. So the standard protocol about uh, 600 mix per liter, a little over a gram per liter for high titer and about two grams per liter for the max titer. And then we compared those to uh, stable CHOS expressing cell line, uh, which in this case was about half a gram per liter, and the XB293 system uh, with a harvest titer of about a gram per liter. All of these samples were protein A purified and run out on non-reduced gels in this case, as well as reduced gels uh, on the next slide. And what we see is a very similar protein quality across the uh, post-protein post A purification of the samples uh, in the XBCHO system compared to stable CHO S or the XB293 system. And then similar, the, these same preparations were tested by size exclusion chromatography uh, for XBCHO on the left-hand panels in the standard high titer and max titer protocols versus stable CHO S in XB293. And we see largely uh, very similar size exclusion chromatography um, chromatograms for the different protocols, as well as between stable CHO S and XB293. But where certainly the, the larger differences lie in the CHO and 293 systems is when it comes to the glycosylation profiles. And again, that was one of the, the key items that we um, wanted to have with the XBCHO system was glycan patterns that matched more closely those of the, uh, the parental CHO S line from which they were derived. So in the top, we see um, the end glycan profiling by Hylic uh, LC FLD MS, and uh, we see XBCHO with a predominant uh, G0F peak for this particular antibody, which uh, with much less of the G G1F. And comparison in the middle to, to stable CHO S, uh, again showing um, predominantly G0F peak with a, with a bit of a G1F and, and very low MAN5. And if we compare that to XB293, we see the G0F uh, goes from the, the mid 80s to about 58%, and the uh, glycosylation profiles are, are more mature and complex for XB293, where we're seeing more of the, the G1F. Um, forms of the protein, as well as a, a small MAN5 peak. So it's, it is interesting that in, in both of the transient systems uh, for this antibody, we see a bit of MAN5, um, whereas in the stable CHO S, uh, very little. But that could also be due to the, um, the uh, titers attained um, in those transient systems, which in this case were much higher than in the stable CHO S system. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up with just some uh, summaries of um, the uh, additional resources that we have um, for the XBCHO system, as well as our next steps. And some of the uh, important additional resources that we have, um, for those of you that have not had an opportunity to, or for those of you that are new to the system, uh, we do have an online instructional YouTube video on our XBCHO website that was uh, performed by our lead scientist on the XB293 and CHO systems, Chaoyan Lu, that shows exactly, in about a seven minute video, exactly how we perform the system here, how we handle the cells, how we uh, perform all of the steps that I went through in detail earlier in this presentation, which is really a wealth of information uh, to help optimize or to help get the system up and running in your lab as quickly as possible. Um, the, uh, certainly, uh, the pictures are worth a thousand words and the videos are, are worth even, even more than that. 
as I mentioned, currently on the website, we do have the scale down application note that takes into account the 2496 well protocols as well as the mini bioreactors. And what we have in progress with some estimated dates that we hope to release these, uh, we have um, a, a number of additional application notes, including an in, in XBCHO um, Q&A. And uh, I've actually attached that the draft of that Q&A to the end of these slides. So anybody um, looking to download these slides will have um, uh, about seven or eight additional pages of XBCHO frequently asked questions. Um, highly detailed responses to some of the um, uh, common questions that we get about the system. And we certainly hope to have that um, fully released onto our website within the uh, May timeframe, June at the absolute latest. As well as optimized purification protocol. So later in the day, uh, you'll hear from one of the scientists on my team, uh, Lena and Panda, who will go over the optimized purification uh, protocol for protein A, uh, purification of IgGs, as well as supernatant uh, clarification. Uh, so that uh, presentation has a, a wealth of information this afternoon uh, that will eventually be captured in a uh, application note, uh, but how to troubleshoot some of the common differences that are seen with purification of XBCHO versus XB293 that are you know, related to uh, the differences in the systems and the componentry of the systems. Uh, but we uh, certainly hope to have that in the, the May-June timeframe on our website as well. And as I mentioned, we are uh, finalizing the conditions for the wave bioreactors and expect to have this released in the June timeframe. Uh, but certainly uh, feel free to uh, reach out to us uh, for any of these preliminary data and guidance that we can provide uh, should you need to move forward. Um, some of these are just us um, getting these ready for release on the website, which takes a little bit of additional time. And then also in collaboration with some external groups, we're working on conditions right now for stir tank bioreactors um, going from relatively small multi-liter scale um, up into the much longer, much larger scales of the stir tank bioreactors. In addition to these application notes, one of the other uh, key activities that we have ongoing is the uh, GMP uh, cell banking of the XBHOS cells. Um, that is um, underway, and we hope to have those cell banks uh, released in the 2017 uh, timeframe uh, for instances where uh, GMP cell banks uh, may be desirable or necessary for the proteins being expressed. And then lastly, as I mentioned, you know, we continue to generate data with our in-house resources around protein quality assessments. And one of the, the key differences, of course, in the XBCHO system versus XB293 and earlier CHO systems is the uh, elongated expression times that we can get uh, from the system. And so along those lines, we're very interested to study the impact of culture uh, temperature shifts as well as expression time on the protein quality attributes. So we um, have a panel of proteins right now that we have harvested uh, at different times across the expression runs using the different protocols that will be performing a much more in-depth uh, review of the post-translational modifications and critical quality attributes of those proteins that we will be able to uh, share as well. So with that, I'd just like to take a few moments to um, thank all of the uh, the XBCHO uh, team members that uh, spent a couple of years developing this system. Uh, on the upper right picture you see that's a, a picture of our Frederick, Maryland Thermo Fisher site and on uh, the bottom right our uh, Grand Island, New York uh, GIPCO home site. And um, just to call out some of the team members, so as I mentioned, Chow Yen Liu, who um, generated the, um, the instructional videos that you'll find online, was our lead scientist in both of our XP293 uh, and CHO systems. Uh, Jan Liu played a critical role in the molecular biology and scale up for the XP CHO system, as well as Virginia Spencer uh, helping all along the way with the design of experiments and the validation of the system, and Sham Kumar for media engineering. And uh, wanted to call out the other team members as well on operations. So I think what, what we show here is just a snapshot of the many people that it took to bring all of these different components together, manufactured across different sites and with different expertises to bring them together into the XPCHO system uh, to allow for, once again, these large um, synergistic increases in protein expression that are the hallmark of being able to optimize um, these systems fully from the ground up. 
So with that, we've only got a, a few minutes for, for Q&As, um, but I am uh, back online later today in the Ask the Expert session. So I will um, go to the Q&As right now and see what has come through during the course of the presentation. And then certainly um, later today, uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern time, uh, I will be back online for a full hour and able to answer um, additional questions at that time. Okay, so um, I will start here with um, the first question that came through um, that uh, asked a question about um, repeating a transfection after 15 passages in the XP Cho cell line and obtaining um, roughly a third of the yield of the cells um, fresh, out of, fresh out of thaw. And the question about is this due to the aging of the cell line? So this is a, a question that we get a lot, um, both for 293 cells and Cho cells. And it's um, quite a, a difficult question to answer fully uh, because there are many different uh, factors that impact the yield of protein and the stability, passage stability of cells over time. So um, one of the key things that we mentioned in the XPCHO system is um, the maintenance of the cells, as I called out earlier, and allowing those cells to typically attain that four to six million uh, cell per mil density at the time of transfection. And so um, the passage stability of cells, again, is um, dependent upon many things. One of them is, of course, um, the consistency of the cell culture over time, uh, whether the cells you know, have been maintained within that window, allowed to get into log phase growth. What we have seen is that in instances, both with XB293 and XB Cho, these being very high density um, cell lines, is that they typically do not like to be split um, before they reach log phase growth. So uh, one uh, word of advice would be to make sure that the cells routinely hit over 4 million cells per mil at the time of subculturing. Um, that is one instance where we have seen um, the performance of the cells taper off a bit over time. The other, of course, is uh, volume and speed and general handling of the cells. Um, one key thing that we do call out in the protocol is that when you prepare your high density cells for transfection, uh, we do not recommend reusing those high density cultures for seeding um, new maintenance flasks. So we recommend that the maintenance flasks are always uh, maintained according to the kit protocol, separately from the transfection, um, the, the flasks that are scaling up for transfection um, to provide the most consistent growth of the, of the cells over time. So while um, it's very difficult to say for, say exactly what passage stability is of the XPCHO cells, you know, what we can say in um, our hands, we typically see very good expression levels through 15 to 20 passages um, with some diminished titers over time. And um, uh, again, that um, has to be taken into account with the entire history and, and handling the cells uh, over time. Okay, so I'm looking at the next questions here. So one question about for proteins that are low yield, uh, that are uh, fairly poor expressors, um, the question is wondering if the yield would increase by increasing the concentration of the enhancer. Um, so the answer to that question is, is no. Um, the enhancer actually is, is fairly robust in terms of its um, uh, the volume of it that can be used. So uh, a bit less enhancer or a bit more is still within the optimal window of the system. And there will, you will reach a point at, at some volume of enhancer that the, um, the enhancer will, become, will have some level of toxicity to the cells. Um, so it, for very low expressing proteins, um, we have not seen that increasing the concentration of the enhancer um, helps there. Uh, it really is that the enhancer as developed with the feed uh, provides the, the highest titers possible um, in that combination. So the, all of the system components have been optimized to work in conjunction with, with one another. And then lastly, um, I'd just like to speak to a question about what kind of plasmid is preferable to reach the highest protein expression levels using XPCHO. Uh, most of the work that we do is with PCDNA 3.4. 
and um, that is a, a CMV driven um, plasmid. We've done also significant work with PCDNA 3.3 and from um, most labs that, that we speak to, any good CMV driven um, vector works very well in the XBCHO system. Again, um, we know by personal experience, PCDNA 3.4 is, is a very good vector, but in general, the CMV vectors work uh, quite well. So I do see that there are a couple of questions that are still pending, but I, I uh, see that we're coming up on time. So I will try to address those at the session later today, uh, 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard. And with that, I will wrap up and thank you all very much for your attention. Uh, great questions, and I hope that you can join us again at, at 2 p.m. Eastern to continue this conversation. And thank you very much. Thank you for bringing that information to us, Dr. Zamuda. I just want to let our audience know that this presentation is going to be available for on-demand viewing through November of 2016. You'll be receiving an email about that. We invite you to share that email with your colleagues. I also want to let you guys know that our next presentation is starting just about now. We hope you'll go over and join us for that. Thank you for joining us today with Lab Roots and Thermo Fisher Dynamic. We'll see you again. <laughs>